We're not on air, are we? Good. Well, if one hopes not, <laughs> I think show the show the no, intent. No, no, Bob, we're not. <laughs> and sisters it's professor jeremiah on three rivers welcome welcome to another episode of the fifth helmet matinee and i believe today's guest is going to uh, really be uh, quite an honor for both of us to have but i believe you will uh, be surprised with today's guest uh, you've seen a number of video clips and even a book on our Fifth Element matinees by today's guest. And though I think it was a dream of both uh, Three Rivers and myself to have him, we didn't know if this would come through, did we? No, we didn't. But with the help of a, a good mutual friend of ours, um, Bob Gregory, <laughs> he was very much the catalyst. Um, but once the blue touch paper was lit, um, our guest had been so compliant and, you know, uh, very helpful and we've had quite a lot of discussions in the meantime hey what are you smoking there professor well i've got my uh thomas Harris new and loaded up in my bowl with some country estate oh right i have tried that because a friend of mine from mississippi sent me a sample oh i can't imagine who mm. would do that now uh for for those who are wondering you can't you can't get country estate anymore, but in the uh, tin, but the Sutliff Black Cordial or Z150 is the same, the same blend. So, well, I'm smoking a Northern Briars Centenary pipe, which celebrated 60 years at the time. Um, numbered one to 60. This is 53. And I'm smoking. <laughs> Are you trying to get number one? No, no. <laughs> I don't even know if it exists. Uh, well, probably. Because this read the right way. I'm smoking oh, Marlin yeah. Flame. And uh, it's a beautiful tobacco. And this is, back in the day, our guests used to smoke this. And it's dark Virginia's um, Cavendish and uh, Louisiana Perique. And the topping is... Um, Whiskey and rum, oh. and it is oh yeah, <laughs> and it is a lovely smoke. I've got to say, and I I so enjoy the Rattray's uh, Wallace Flake um, as well. So I think another tin of this will be procured at some stage. Uh, is that what you had with you in the field the other day when you had Molly out for a walk? Yeah, I've been smoking it constantly a lot. What side by side with Fusilier's Ration. Um, which is an English blend, which was kindly sent to me by Dave um, Trailing the Woolly Mammoth. So thank you, David. Thoroughly enjoying it. <laughs> but I've been smoking that in um, my Eldritch Three Rivers uh, reading pipe. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a big bowl, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I have been reading it, reading while I've been using it. So I've been taking Molly out, coming back, and we've just doing our warming down session and I've been lighting up then. So yeah, it's been good. 
Well, well we Commander McBride with us today, Professor. Definitely, definitely. Let's uh, let's see what the commander has for us today. There, the Hudson River. Did I tell you about my amazing escape act? Speaking of escape, Commander, I really... As mystifying McBragg the magician, I was locked in the world's most secure object, a United States mailbox. The box was tossed into the Hudson River. I had only a few moments to make my escape, holding my breath, don't you know? But nothing could hold me. Quickly, I was out and greeted by wild applause and cheers. Everywhere, I was asked to repeat this marvelous trick. Perfect every time, until that fateful day. As the mailbox struck the bottom of the river, a giant octopus locked his eight arms around it. I spied the beast through the mailbox slot. I poked at him, and he released the dark ink an octopus uses as a smoke screen. My breath was giving out. Terrifying. What did you do? Realizing I was in a U.S. mailbox, I used the octopus ink to write a quick note of help. A postman spied the note and promptly dealt with the octopus. And I won my greatest triumph. I'd say that story ended with a really happy note. Quite. So, uh... He was an escape artist also. Yeah, and it ended on a happy note. How droll was that? <laughs> anyway. Uh, well, the only part of that that is unbelievable mm. <laughs> was I don't think the postman would have responded without a stamp. He might have demanded a stamp. That could have been it. He could have gone gone for the jugular. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, our guest, we, we've got a, a double whammy, haven't we? We, we? we do. Now, now I'm going to say before we go to our guest, we have a little uh, promo that covers the topic we're going to be talking about. But go ahead and talk a little bit about our guest uh, before we go into this. Uh... Right. Well, one, I did a little promo film to sort of raise the profile. Of, not that he really needs it, of um, our guest. And I've made a couple of faux pas. Um, our guest is, his true Christian name is Sir Walter John Scott, fifth baronet. But he likes to be called, he calls himself Sir John Scott. Um, Johnny Scott and Johnny, preferably. And I <laughs> misguidedly thought he was, um, because he has a range of snuff called the Sir Walter Scott's snuff quality snuff. And I mistakenly thought he was related to Sir Walter Scott of the Ivanhoe fame, which I put in between a couple of tins of his snuff, a picture of Sir Walter Scott, first baronet of Abbotsford, mistakenly. So I got a nice note from uh, Johnny, if I might read it. <laughs> Steve, this looks jolly. That's the film I did. One point. Abbotsford is not the family home, and Sir Walter Scott, the novelist, is not a relation. My ancestor was a publisher who received a baronetcy for works to literature, and the family Christian name has always been Walter. I am officially Sir Walter, not Sir John, my second Christian name, but I chose to call myself Sir John to avoid the confusion between us and the Abbotsford lot. <laughs> I didn't recognize Abbotsford when you mentioned it during the chat, as a house in the photo I had was very similar to his grandparents' home. So forgive me, Sir John, um, but if Johnny Scott, he, 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 like me in his youth, used to enjoy Uncle Jack Hargreaves, and he, he agrees that Jack Hargreaves has been promoted on our matinee so many times, was a crusader and ambassador for the countryside and conservation and the old um, countryside law, uh, folklore. And Sir Johnny has taken on that mantle and he did a series uh, with the BBC, um, again, championing the, um, the country ways. But in this, this more, I don't call it modern age, 
deprived age, I don't know. Um, it's sort of frowned upon, uh, the sort of countryside. So the likes of um, Jack Hargreaves and Johnny Scott, you don't see many, you don't, if at all. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a background to Sir John. So Walter John, Johnny Scott, fifth baronet, succeeded his father, Sir Walter Scott, as baronet in 1992. He is a, a natural historian or historian of nature, um, broadcaster, columnist, countryside campaigner and farmer. Um, the information we got back in 2016, he held the following position. So keep with me. Joint master of the North, North Pennine Hunt, founder member of the Chumley Coursing Club, president of the Union of Country Sports Workers, president of the Gamekeepers Welfare Trust, president of the Tay Valley Wildfowlers Association, vice president of the Heather Trust, patron of the Sporting Lucas Terrier Association. You know, you're seeing with his dog, that's Tug, and the hit, hopefully Tug will feature in our matinee. Patron of the Wildlife Art Trust, centenary patron of the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. I highlight the word conservation. Patron, the National Association of Beaters and Pickers Up, and board member of the European Squirrel Foundation Federation, I should say. So I hope that's cleared up a few things for me, if nobody else. We, when we were setting this up, um, Johnny said to me, Steve, I, I've never done Zoom before, anything like that. I said, don't worry, I'll, I'll talk you through it. So being in the UK, I'm on the telephone. He's going through on his computer. And we had this one glitch at the end where we had audio, but no picture. And we finally found out the reason for that was no camera. <laughs> so we had to readily then uh, get um, Johnny on his phone. So at this stage, we've, we've got the phone going, that's fine, everything's running right, but obviously the battery on his phone is limited. So with all that in our way, we still found a success. We found a solution and we got through. And I, I, I thank him so much for his patience and perseverance. It's a bit like being talked down trying to, uh, flying a Dakota and I was in the conning tower, <laughs> but he landed safely. So I hope hope everyone enjoys this. I'm going to. <laughs> uh, we are here going to show a little uh, uh, a little miniature documentary on snuff, and right. the reason why snuff. And I'm not a snuff partaker. I don't believe uh, Three Rivers is a snuff partaker. No, nope. but uh, that's mostly what sir john uh is involved in these days and i thought this little mini documentary uh which is a bit uh aged documentary i thought that it would it, give people a little insight as to the topic that we're going to be covering today yeah. i know there's a number of people when i go to pipe club in birmingham there's a number of people there who are snuff uh partakers and i'll say this on my part the reason Whenever I've been offered a sample, I always turn it down by saying, I'm not going to take any because I'm afraid I would enjoy it. Yeah. And if you saw how much space of my, my desk is taken up with just my pipe smoking, <laughs> I, I don't need another hobby. So if I was to enjoy the snuff, I would then want to collect snuff boxes. I would want to try different snuff blend. <laughs> that so for that crazy. reason, I've said no. <laughs> yeah. Snuff. Certainly you'd be in fashion, for the habit which recalls an era of Regency elegance and courtesy is becoming the fashion fad of the 60s. Sniff it with precision by both nostrils and without any grimace. And that was the advice offered to snuff takers a century ago. Perhaps we've forgotten some of the elaborate etiquette of Victorian days, but the snuff blender has not lost any of his skill. And don't think snuff is some exotic Eastern herb, it's simply tobacco, specially selected tobacco. Mm -hmm. 
Some lingering traditions of the 18th century still remain. The snuff blender, the connoisseur who adds those tantalizing and alluring perfumes, jealously guards his secret recipes. Sometimes only the head of a snuff firm knows this secret, a secret which is passed on to the next generation. But there's one man who can prize information from unwilling lips, the customs officer, who keeps a check on the tobacco and oils which are used. Blended, scented, sieved, and take a deep breath, for delicate flavoring can cost 20 pounds a fluid ounce. Today's youth haven't turned their nose up at this strange ritual of yesterday's dandies. They've inherited a passion for snuff taking, which has created a surprise boom for the quaint snuff shops, which still offer a dignified service to the discerning customer. Fancy a snuff handkerchief, sir? Or perhaps one of these ornate snuff boxes? belong to an age which lies buried in a history book. But don't think those dandies were the only people to appreciate the mysterious concoctions of the snuff blenders. It's a four million pound industry in Britain alone, and that's a figure which certainly can't be sneezed at. It's no good sniffing at the snuffing habits of past generations, for today's partygoers enjoy a pinch of jasmine or Bordeaux instead of a pink gin. Yes, organized snuff parties have become the fashion. Everywhere, nostrils are revitalized and noses tickled pink. Sniff and be merry, that's the snuff party motto, but beware, snuff sneezers are a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Sniff and be merry. <laughs> yeah, I, oh. I think you can get away with that. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can you imagine a snuff party like that? I mean, that that is in the time period when people would have cocktail parties and, you know, everybody's all dressed up. Uh, <laughs> a snuff party. <laughs> It's, a, it's, a, it's an old language, isn't it, really, coming back? It has different connotations these days, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, we're not recommending anybody take this up. <laughs> no, but his table, did you see all the, like you say, the, the snuff boxes? And, oh. yeah, the snuff seems to be coming back. There's, the, you know, it... And I don't think it's pipe smokers going over to snuff. I think it's snuff standalone. You know, maybe, um, you know, cigarette smokers. I don't know, but it, it does seem to be quite a demand now, uh, increasing. So it's um, it's on the up for whatever and, reason. And I know one of the members of the YTPC, uh, Cobbett of the Shire. I know he has quite a collection of snuff boxes, mm. uh, and has been collecting them over a period of time. So. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Pipe Tree's not got a good collection as well. <laughs> he's he's of everything else. Yeah, oh, I bet for sure. He's he's probably got a big collection of them. And if he were here, he would be happy to show it to us, wouldn't he? Oh yeah, <laughs> always fascinating. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's get into this uh, first half of the interview with Sir Johnny, and uh, he's just a he's really a character, and for me. It was a and just a great privilege to be able to sit down and chat with him. I, I would love to do it again, just I, full of stories. And I feel like we only just got one little drip oh. of stories out of the faucet for, for what he has in store. Well, I, I can only say that when we were talking on the telephone, coming up to the filming on a couple of occasions, we just got into a conversation about farming, conservation, yeah, pipe smoking, uh, snuff manufacture, but every I, I I again I was it's just a sponge listening to him, and I've just kept reminding myself and saying to him, I have to stop, 
<laughs> keep your powder dry. This is all the you know quality of what you know we're looking forward to hearing, or hopefully most people are going to look forward to hearing. I, I will say you may see a couple of edits in the video, and hopefully they're not too rough for people out there. I had to do a little bit of editing because there was some secrets that was being revealed. Uh, that oh yeah. Was, uh, at times, some of our guests and visitor forgot that we were recording. Well, I think they were led astray because I think the the chap who replaced the dancing girl said to me, "We're not recording, are we?" I went, "No." <laughs> <laughs> So there's a few trade secrets started flipping out there, and um, uh, yeah, I said flipping. Uh, so yeah, I think I'll let I'll let you go on with it, Professor. <laughs> well, all right, let's uh, let's let's go into our interview here with Sir Johnny. Yeah. Welcome, Sir Johnny Scott. Johnny, thank you very much. I've been nice to do it. Yeah, wonderful moment. I've got to say, so surreal. I'm in front of your um, your historical home there. I don't know if you'd noticed. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, Abbotsford. Yeah. <laughs> your ancestral home. I, right. I'd like to think they still keep an apartment there for you, Johnny. No, unfortunately not. Oh. We have a word for those people, don't we, children? We do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I take it we're not allowed to use it on um, grown up <laughs> no. Oh, Johnny, thanks for joining us. I, I've got a few hopefully innocuous questions. If I touch any nerves, you just say pass, but don't yeah. say it yet. <laughs> um, you, you don't smoke your pipe at the moment. I think you're saying to me you've been bullied into uh, extinguishing it for the time being or for uh, Yeah, whatever. that's right. I was, I was warned off after after at least 60 years, I was told to stop. Wow. Well, um, going it's back in the day. Your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, you know, what was your go-to brand back in the I, day? I, I started smoking Astley's 109. My father and grandfather always bought their tobacco and pipes from Astley's. Um, and then I went from Astley's 109 to Players No Name, and from Players No Name to Benson and Hedges' original Virginia Flake. And then for the last, ooh, 30 years, I suppose, I smoked Rattry's Marlin Flake. Well, that in itself is a good smoke, and it's still available today. As you say, it's not no longer made in Scotland, is it? It's, is no, it just... it's made by um, Kohlhaus and Klopp, I think they're called, in Germany. Klopp. Don't mention that name. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the rat trades I haven't smoked. I have um, smoked uh, Wallace Flake, which is one of my top, top, um, brand, so I, I will have to try try the Marlin. Uh, yeah, Marlin, it's, um, it's a dark, mature Virginia. Mm. It, it's um, got a topping of rum and or whiskey, hasn't it? Rum or whiskey. Well, it it, it, it wasn't flavoured with anything. It was just no. the way it had been matured that made it a very fruity Virginia smoke. And I think there's dark Cavendish in there as well. Um, Possibly, or maybe not. I, I, pro I haven't smoked, so I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. I, 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 I think I, it's just a pure Virginia. They pure certainly Virginia. never had it. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll take that as red then. So yeah. When you were when you were filming with the BBC, did you have a particular blend you were smoking then, or was it just? Yeah, that would, that would that would have been Marlin Flake. Always smoked. Marlin Flake for about the last 30 years, so that would definitely have been Marlin Flake when the BBC was filming. Okay. I noticed in the day during those programmes, you, you generally smoked a, a straight pipe. Yeah, I love it. <sighs> Nearly all, all day. Every, that was, I always smoked Lovett's during the day. Mm. Did you have a particular brand of pipe? 
Do yeah, they were all, I always bought them from Astley's. Astley's in Germany. Ah, they were all Astley's, right. Yeah. And then when Astley's, when Astley's went broke, um, you know, they couldn't afford to pay the rent anymore. Um, the, um, their stock was bought up by a chap called Mordecai Azrati. <laughs> right. <laughs> then, then Good luck, you Mordecai. lad. <laughs> and, and I used to buy them from him. But, Sir Johnny, well, I don't know, did you partake in snuff back in the day? When I was a, when I was a teenager, in those days, there were wonderful shops in the West End of London, upmarket smoking shops. There was Astley's, there was Sullivan's in the Burlington Arcade, um, there was Morland's in Grosvenor Street, who made James Bond's fags. And then there was Freiburg and Treyer in the Haymarket, where they made snuff to Georgian recipes. And it mm. was like stepping back 200 years to go in there. Brilliant. And the wonderful um, order books they had from um, all the sort of Regency eccentrics, you know, Beau Brummel and all those sort of people who were around in those days. And I'd always been fascinated by it. Um, it was a, a period of history that's always fascinated me. And about 10 years ago, I was researching something about the Georgian era and that period of 150 years when virtually nobody smoked and everybody took snuff. And I had some old Havana cigars lying about in the house. And I thought, well, I'll have a go and see if I can make some. So I ground them up in a coffee grinder, yeah. chucked in a glass of brandy and stirred them round. Wow. And <laughs> I, I sent it to a chap who, unfortunately, he's no longer making snuff, but he was hand making snuff. And he said, it's absolutely wonderful. Have you got enough to sell? And of course I hadn't, but I said, it won't take me very long to make some more. And um, so I made some more and he said, well, the, the person to send it to is a chap who runs a worldwide snuff distribution website uh, called Mr. Snuff, who, curiously enough, is a Scotsman who was a pilot in Canada who stopped being a pilot and set up this worldwide snuff distribution website. And from my point of view, the, the fun of it is trying to emulate Georgian snuffs and working out who was at war with whom at the time and where they were sourcing tobacco from, what they were using to blend to make their snuffs and what flavorings, if any, were available at the time. And so having started with one, I think I've now got, got about 16. 16, yeah. yeah. I, do you know, I, you've read written you're an author of many wonderful books wonderful countryside books have you and it's my ignorance that i don't know if you've actually done one on snuff no i never have yeah um, because that that's part of history that we, will go by and people won't be able to recollect or research it probably yes and that that amazing period when thousands of snuff boxes were made. Mm. Um, you know, wooden ones, silver ones, some made out of, believe it or not, potato skin. Um, there was a, a, a type of snuff box made, um, it was called Brunswick ware, which was rather like making papier mache, but they were made with potato skins. And silver snuff boxes by the ton, because silver is a great conductor of heat. And, um, and as you know, they're, they're worn in a pocket close to the body. And the idea was that the body would warm the snuff up and improve the flavors. Well, you 
16 variants of snuff that you do and, and two of your most popular. One is, and excuse if I'm not pronouncing this correctly, is, is it Roslane? 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 Yeah, Roslane, yeah, there's an umlaut over the O. Roslane, it means little rose in Germany. In oh, Germany. right. Now, I, in my romantic way, I didn't know if that was some play on word with Roslane Chapel, which is not far from here. <laughs> no, no. So, it's not. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was Queen Charlotte's favorite snuff, and um, it it's basically it's made basically with Sumatra leaf because at the time um, the principal source of tobacco would have been from Cuba, um, and it's flavored with uh, what was called attar guru, but basically attar of roses. Um, and bitter almonds, and it has ambergris in it, because ambergris was a scent fixative. And that was Queen Charlotte's favorite snuff. Um, John, Johnny, uh, what's that other, um, the, your top snuff, the, the other one? There's another very popular snuff, isn't there, in your range? Well, uh, the first one that I made was, um, is called creme de figue. That's it. Um, Roseline and creme de figue, and one or two of the other ones are moist snuffs. And creme de figue is, is a, a copy of Beau Brummel's favorite snuff, which, was a right. which he called Old Paris. But again, it's made with Sumatra leaf mm. um, and it's flavored with fig arak. Well, that was part of your uh, initiative, really, with Bo Brummel, probably one of the people that sort of uh, got you really interested in this, you were saying. Um, so, it, and that's going well, is it, Johnny? Yes, the I mean, yeah, it does. I mean, I, you know, the, there are aficionados, and mainly in America. Um, most of the stuff goes to America. Now, have you noticed an increase in sales, or is it pretty much plateaued, staying the same? Or no, it's, it is quite interesting because I think that um, I am just assuming that the smoking ban came into America before it did in Britain, um, or maybe for some unknown reason the Americans kept their snuff culture where we lost it. Um, when I was a child, there were a lot of people who took snuff. And when I was briefly in Lloyd's, you know, the underwriting market in London, the underwriters all took snuff. Um, but it pretty well died out here. Although in America, it does seem to be still very popular. Johnny, can I just, um, I mean, I don't know if you've got time for hobbies. I, you know, other than uh, producing the, I know it, it's a business, but I know you enjoy the snuff and it's a, a hobby there. Yeah. But are you still very active in the hunting, shooting, riding? Fraternity? Yes. I mean, I, yeah, obviously, I mean, I'm still um, actively involved in a lot of field sports organisations. Um, and I still hunt and shoot and fish and of course before they banned it um i used to keep coursing greyhounds down in your part of the world yeah chumley yeah <laughs> well chumondly yeah. as the, the natives uh, yeah. from other parts may call it yeah it's a lovely yeah. estate there lovely yeah uh, um back in the day when you did smoke your pipe was there a particular favorite that you would pack that um rattray's marlin flake with and Go and sit in a comfy chair after a particular nice meal. Well, in if I was going to um, um, at night, you know, if one is sort of sitting down with a book, I had a a big old Hungarian. You know what I mean? A, a full yeah. bent, like like um, like a noon Paul, um, and I tended to pack that with. Um, 
a, a sort of Cavendish Oriental Virginia Latakia mix, like All right. um, like um, the Dunhill three six. Is it no? What was it? Nine six five. Yeah. Yes. Dun, Dunhill nine six five, and Astley's did one called Number One. Um, you know, because it got a big deep bowl and would last for ages. It was a, um, and the shape of it, you know, was tremendously comfortable because it, it would, when you were reading, it would rest on your chest. Yes. There's a, a, a mutual friend of ours called Wolfgang pulling up in Germany. He has one that has a lint lanyard, goes round his neck to hold it there, and he calls it his big Bertha. Uh, <laughs> I should love to watch this. I would love to have had one of those um, really long, long stem Meerschaum pipes that you see oh. sometimes. Um, yeah, I had, a, I had one or two calabashes, Meerschaum calabashes. They're a jolly good smoke. Did you, uh, on your travels, ever come across something called Northern Briars? Yes. Yeah, I did. The trouble was that... that that um, I suppose because father and grandfather always bought their pipes from Astley's. Yeah. Um, and as far as they were concerned, <laughs> you know, that was the only place that you got pipes from. So I tended to to follow. <laughs> uh, how how old were you when you started smoking a pipe? I would think about sixteen, Professor. It made well, uh, me feel very manly. <laughs> I was going to say, what took you in that direction? <laughs> well, again, my father. But um, when it came to cigarettes in those days, you will have heard of Sullivan's cigarettes. I was 17 when I started getting into the, the pipe. <laughs> Wait, I beat I'm, you by a year. Yes, well, I'm, I'm still a couple of years behind you overall. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you a thing I did, um, which has got nothing to do with pipes or snuff, but I did go out to Havana a few years ago, and that is something I would recommend anybody who's got an interest in smoking to do, mm. to actually smoke Havana cigars in the place they're made. And of course, at a fraction of the price is yeah. just glorious. <laughs> Talking of days gone by, we have a mutual friend, don't we? Uh, I think he was involved with the, the beginnings or some of your snuff making, um, Sir, Sir Robert uh, Bob Kendall. Gregory. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bob, yeah, Bob's absolutely wonderful. You see, and I used to buy the tobacco from him. Mm. And Samuel Garrett's snuff emporium was just, I mean, it was like going into a museum. They'd got machinery there. They'd got a gigantic pestle that I think they bought in about 1720. And it had originally been used for making gunpowder. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's a colossal thing. I mean, it's as big as this, bigger than this office of mine here that I'm talking in. A wonderful chap, Bob. And Rob yeah. Graham, who is now, now at Wilson's. Rob, Rob Young, rather. Who's a um, it's, it's a shame that, uh... And the, the BBC did never have you kind of go through the pipe smoking tobacco community. Was that ever kicked around by any chance in Carissa and the Countryman? No, it never did. I mean, um, of course, none of them smoked, as you, as you can imagine, at least yeah. not tobacco anyway. <laughs> 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 No, smoking was already being frowned on in those days. Did yeah. did they kind of come down hard on you as far as smoking your pipe on the show, or? Well, no, I don't think they dared. I mean, they, <laughs> I mean, there was there were so many other things that they were hysterically worried about. You know, <laughs> bearing in mind that that the BBC had absolutely no intention whatsoever in making programs that were sympathetic to field sports. Yeah. Um, it, well, um, I'm sure the Fox Hunt was a real touchy uh, show. It was, yes. Uh, it was. Although, 
you know, the, uh, the, every time we got a BBC crew, you know, they would look at me with absolute revulsion as if they expected me to pull a live rabbit out of my pocket and start eating it. But by, by the end of the week's filming, um, not just because of Clarissa and I, but because of the gamekeepers and the river bailiffs and the hunt servants and the country people that, who were good enough to be contributors to the programs. The extraordinary thing about it is that they were all coming round and saying, um, you know, my, I can remember my grandfather kept ferrets and, you know, mm. or I had an uncle that used to shoot pigeons. I mean, the, the sad thing about the situation we're in today is that if you scratch a townie, you'll find a countryman underneath. Oh, Johnny, it's, in my book it says that. I can't get the, the dancing girls. They've but gone. why not? I, I've tried you, to get the substitute. <laughs> They you, promised you, me a substitute, Johnny, but I don't know what it is, but we'll see. Are we still unlocked, Professor? No, yeah, 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 we're fine. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I had just watched uh, yesterday The Fox Hunt, and, I, and I, I really thought it was great when you're sitting horseback smoking your pipe. Oh, Thank my goodness. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad the dancing girls are dressed because... Uh, <laughs> Robert, Robert, good to see you, sir. A little bit of a surprise there, Johnny. It is, yeah. Yeah. I always, you know, that fox hunting scene, <laughs> Clarissa had never been on a horse before, I don't think. And um, whilst we were, we were making the program on all the people who were involved in putting somebody on a horse for a day's hunting, the breeches makers, the boot makers, the, you know, the, the hunter breeders, you name it, um, and the BBC kept saying, you know, has Clarissa ever ridden? Because there's a serious health and safety issue here. And I said, well, <laughs> as far as I know, she hasn't. And they said, for goodness sake, can you not give us some riding lessons? And she absolutely refused to. Um, oh, wow. By the time we got to making the 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 actual hunting scene, the BBC, they even, they even went so far as getting a, a body double in case, in oh, case, they, in case wow. they couldn't Clarissa on the horse. <laughs> and on the actual day, she came out all dressed up and there was the mounted field there and the hounds and everybody was ready to go. It was just a matter of getting Clarissa onto this horse that had specially been selected as being a Clydesdale cross, so enormous, and <laughs> to carry the weight and be absolutely bomb-proof. And she said, nobody was to touch her except me. And the cameras weren't to be on. And uh, so I got a leg into the stirrup. And then I got underneath and started to heave upwards. And I heaved and heaved and heaved, almost got her into the saddle when she started to come back down again. <laughs> and, I, and she settled on my hat as though this immense weight pressing down on me and these vast buttocks overflowing my head and face. And there I was, all alone in the darkness, when I heard the terrierman who was a great mate of mine called Bob Gibson, I distinctly heard Bob say to a friend of his, you know, if Britch's material gives, it'll be a digging out job. <laughs> <laughs> Which terrier people will know, digging out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know who was more surprised at that moment, Clarissa or, or the horse, when she <laughs> find herself airborne. <laughs> they they were great series, Johnny. Great series. I, in our little private conversation, we talked to the mutual hero of ours, Jack Hargreaves. Yeah. Well, you see, there he is. At, you know, at a time back in the 1950s when so many people working on the land 
were being displaced by machinery and people were leaving the land and going and finding jobs in the town. Those Jack Hargreaves out of town series yeah. were a sort of lifeline to them. Mm. And the ethos of the programmes was in, the, in that dreadful little jingle that went with it. You know, the song that went, yeah. oh, I'm not going to do it because it'll be stuck in my mind, but the ethos was that if the country, that if you work or live in a town, it's jolly bad luck on you. But if you take the trouble to come out of town, the paradise that country people have is available to everybody. You don't have to be a rich man to ferret or foot follow or shoot pigeons or fish. It's all there. All you've got to do is come out of town. And they ran every week. I, I've lo I, I can't remember how many thousands of programs he made. But when he died in about 1975, that's when the rot set in because it'd been nothing representative of what goes on in the British countryside since. And when the, the Blair government announced that they were going to punish rural Britain by destroying their heritage, I thought to myself, well, if only we could get something like the Jack Hargreaves programmes on the telly, it might it might turn the tide a bit. And if you don't know somebody in television, you'll never have a, a chance to get an idea across to anybody. And Clarissa, of course, I knew when she made those terribly famous um, Two Fat Ladies cookery programs. Johnny, the amazing. I was going to say, can I take you back just a little bit? Because I know, yeah. I know we couldn't get the dancing girls, but Bob's joined us. <laughs> What a lovely surprise that was. I'm disappointed he's not wearing the ermine. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How are you? I'm all boy? right. How are you? Oh, I'm very happy and very poor. You know, I'm, yeah, just, well, a, I'm just a commoner. Don't forget, I'm just a commoner. <laughs> and, and, you've got a, and, and you've got an empty glass, too, I can see. Well, it's no good asking, oh, well, I've got an empty bloody whiskey bottle as well. <laughs> empty, oh, Lord, that's a shame. Times are so hard, I've got two. Oh. <laughs> I've got, a, I've got a clean hanky here somewhere. Uh, can I take you two gentlemen back to the day when you had your coffee grinder, Johnny? And, yeah. Uh, I think young, young, young Robert at the time was coming up to see you at the farm, was he? You thought he was the inland. Uh, no, I, I never, I never got the invitation. There were too you many didn't. sheep. <laughs> you can't get past this. You should have had join the queue, Bob. <laughs> I couldn't find a pair of wellies big enough. Hi, yeah. Professor. How are you? Hey, very good. Very good. Good to have you with us. Oh, Robert, thanks for joining us, because uh, I know no, you've, got, you've got um, guests today, haven't you? I, I, I often have a chuckle about the, uh, the, uh, the, the food grinders and poor Lady Mary with uh, her errant well, husband. Professor, Professor, this reminds me, this, this, this so re reminds me of the old Samuel Gower snuff mill. So a wonderful first part of the interview. Uh, uh, the dancing girls didn't quite look as I had expected. <laughs> Not quite, did they? Um, they would have been more clean shaven, I'm sure. <laughs> more of I, I'm probably not quite as entertaining as Sir Bob. Uh, <laughs> you know in my youth growing up, my one of my heroes, as you know, and many people that I know, pipe smokers, uh, was Jack Hargreaves. A luncheon at the Savoy Hotel to select the Pipe Man of the Year from some of Britain's best-known pipe-smoking celebrities. And the winner, Jack Hargreaves, television's countryside expert, who received a silver briar pipe trophy engraved with the names of past winners. 
Another reward for his success, a presentation set of pipes, enough to keep him going for his year of office. Jack, who has been placed in the contest for the last two years, didn't seem at all puffed out by his victory. And he was also a hero of uh, Sir Johnny. And I was saying, he's taken over that mantle and then BBC, we're going to do more, then it all got kicked to one side. I think there might be a story that probably enhances that situation. Um, well, so it's been nobody really to crusade for the conservation and countryside. And as Sir Johnny says, get into the countryside, breathe it, meet the people, see what's going on there. And when you enjoy the countryside, it's not there by accident. It's been produced by farming. It's been produced in conservation. Um, we, we talk about shooting and pheasants and partridge and... Um, yeah, the environment that's created there for those birds, for that quarry, uh, is it, there's so many beneficiaries to it in wildlife, like songbirds and, uh, and such, that we wouldn't have today. Skylarks, uh, because the predators, the magpies, the corvids, the fox, they would have destroyed them completely. Um, now, having said that, gamekeepers don't go out to destroy uh, the predators. They keep them to a manageable level. Uh, well, and we even have, and, and I, due to controversy, I won't go into the whole aspect of it because it still seems very controversial, but we have cases where there are animals that when hunting was made illegal or banned on that particular animal, over the years that animal actually almost starved itself out and when this was in africa as i say it's very controversial so i won't wade too far into those waters but when those animals were dropping dead the the country that they were dying in made it illegal to even take pictures of these animals starving to death and so for that reason, it's still kept very hush-hush. But with hunters previously going in and, and thinning the herd, it preserved that animal. And then when they outlawed uh, hunting for that particular species, they wiped themselves out because there wasn't enough food in the region any longer to sustain the animal. So it, again, conservation, protecting a species, hunters, you think of, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt was a big conservationist, you know, set aside, you know, large portions of America for people to enjoy, for the animals to be preserved in, but he was a hunter. Mm. And many hunters at that time period, uh, are the ones who we can thank today for having preserved so much of the wildlife for us. You know, and, and if people can just understand or have an open mind, if you like, as to how this works, if you, and there's such people as vegans, and they don't have anything that's attached, you know, eat anything that's attached to, to an animal, or it's got a face, whatever, and I respect that entirely, but even they, unbeknowingly are probably wearing leather shoes, leather belts. You know, the, there is a byproduct that's gone into the, the system somewhere. But, you know, in conservation is about, you know, looking after things and, and the resources. Um, and I just want people to have an open mind. If you look at the regular diet of people, the chickens and bacon and, and beef, you know, there's no chance for those things. They're bred to die. Uh, but with the the countryside, the birds, etc., the um, the grouse in particular, that you can't falsely breed these things. You can give them an environment to live in and breed, but you can't breed them. Uh, but that environment, um, even with the uh, the heather, the the gamekeepers will burn the heathers off on the hillside in, in squares. So there's a, a, nat the, a natural. It, there's a managed fire gap there each time and some of these places have been shut down for shooting and now just gone to rack and ruin and when they have fires they go on for months um yeah. but the thing is when you go shooting it's a sport so you know by that 
the 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 actual um, target species has a chance to get away, you know, and live another day. He's not going to go into and get a bolt through its head, and that's it. Well, uh, that's yeah, that's one thing in this, uh, Carissa, in the country, where they're going fox hunting. You get a a sense of how many people's lives depend on this tradition because they, of course, go to the saddlery where they're, you know, making the saddles and, you know, preparing for the horse. Uh, they uh, go to the uh, tailors uh, for Carissa to be outfitted, uh, so, yeah, which I, I, it's all comical in and of itself. But, and I'll put a link down in the bucket below so somebody can watch the whole episode because I'm just going to put a few little clips in. But you think of how many lives are dependent on these various skills and suddenly when you say you can't do this anymore it wipes out several jobs right. it wipes out a tradition uh it, and the, story, the farriers you know the the kennels the kennel keepers everything i mean it, it's a tradition it's a countryside tradition and people look over the fence and say, oh I don't like that well you know we all probably do things people don't like but you know you have to have respect i i respect people that are anti but i just think it's about education perhaps so maybe it's i need educating i don't know <laughs> i'll also put in at the end of this after the fox hunt there's a little clip which you had sent me of uh carissa and the countryman where he's with his terrier and uh in one of the clips they're uh rat hunting yeah, well, <laughs> and, uh, and and he said, you know, that uh, uh, you know, ratting and hunting are two uh, you know, favorite hobbies. Yeah, well, the can I say in that clip, Tug, that's his terrier. Um, I was actually, uh, oh, don't want to go off on one really. I was at the Cheshire show, and uh, Clarissa nearly ran me down. I was talking to Bob James, and she came round on the quad bike. Where's the terriers? Where's the terriers? I said, they're over there. And in that clip uh, that's in there, I didn't realize that they're putting the two together. And he said, yeah, that was at the Peeva show that year. So that was the year, and I think Tug won a prize. But they went um, conger eel hunting it. I think it was North Wales. And uh, the chap there had a big pole, and he had a, a spaniel. And he said, when the tie goes out, the, you know, the conger eels are sort of hiding around here. He, he couldn't find any. And this is a, an experienced guy. Tug went off, sniffed that under it into the holes and that, like a terrier does, you know, in the earth, but these are in rocks. And he whipped out a couple of conger eels, which they had cooked up and ate on the beach that day. Um, he was a tremendous dog, um, a wonderful dog. I think probably a dog of a lifetime. For yes. Yeah. When I saw the dog, he looked very similar to a terrier that my uncle had. And that terrier's name was Ralph. Ralph. <laughs> Ralph. Ralph. <laughs> and, uh, but, it, but the terrier looked very similar to, to old Ralph. I just saw a picture at my parents the other day of, of a very young professor <laughs> with, uh, with Ralph at my grandmother's house. But, uh, uh, you know, terriers, are, terriers sometimes are underrated. Oh. Uh, here in the states, but they make excellent dogs. You just, it, as with any with any canine, you have to give them the room to exercise and to fill that purpose in life. That's it. They're all designed for a, a purpose, and they're a great ratter, a terrier, rabbits, whatever that kind of thing. In fact, I let's think get let's let's yes, get on yes. with the show here. I know yes. you and I could talk for a long time, so uh, it's been a little while since we visited so yeah. let's uh let's check out this uh fox hunt and the terrier as well many of your days hunting tomorrow oh, it's always so exciting it'll be all right <laughs> he's looking very well isn't he he's looking very well yes he doesn't know what he's got in store for it well no, that's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the horses are on the way we're on the way yeah yeah and tomorrow you're gonna have it's a wonderful day. Well, I hope so. Yeah. Isn't it marvellous that hunting started again? You want to put all the energy back Yeah, in. it's got a right buzz back mm. into the countryside again.
Um, what I suggest you do, as you've got a big foot and a big instep, that we have to make a boot that will have laces over the top yeah. to mm. get your foot in. So how long have you been here, Mr. Burton? Well, we've been here in this village making boots since 1967. Mm -hmm. But previous to that, we were in Northampton. <laughs> Hunt servants with. That's right, yes. Yeah. It's nice. That's a bonnet thing, isn't it? Mm. There, all ready. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? There you are. Thank you. Handy, isn't it? Mm. Mr. Ripley's. Finest. Superb coat. Yes, good at him, Mr. Ripley. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Today? Yeah, it's a bit larger than normal, but because uh, normally we're maybe have only six or ten on a Wednesday. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously we all have to come in today. It's going to be a bit bigger. <laughs> <laughs> We've pulled in the crowd. Yeah, a you bit. have. Where do you, Where does the hunt get its, <laughs> its funds from? Well, we're run by a committee which does yeah. a lot of social evenings, uh, yeah. social nights, which you're probably coming to on tonight. Singing yeah. such like so, domino drives. Yeah. Everybody keeps coming up with another idea, a quiz yeah. or something like yeah. that, and, and then we'll, you know, it, it maybe raises fifty, sixty, hundred pound each little thing we do, but it's somehow amazing how it amounts up. Yeah. Yeah, it's up, it's too dangerous for the terrors, isn't it? Um, Lift it up, you know, for one does lose. Yeah, well, I was, I was going to ask you if, if that would be OK. We could do it. Yeah, just prop it up. Because there's still there. one or two under, aren't there? Yeah. yeah. No, I need, it. I need somebody with a bit more grunt. Here we go. Wait, Come on, Clarissa, say? come and sit on the end of this pole. OK. <laughs> OK. Have you enjoyed that? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Are we done? <laughs> 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 Where is he? <laughs> Most of them are being killed underground, so it is achieving its purpose. Um, and um, periodically the terriers are marking where there's a nest and we're digging them out just to make sure that the young are killed and then filling the holes back in again. <laughs> There it is. Good dog, Tug. Good dog, Tuggy. Here they come, dog. Well done, Tug. Who's your rat? Isn't that been fun? Yeah. Did it be fun? Yeah. Seeing the terriers working them out on the banks. Yeah. Enjoying yourself for that. Great to get out with them, isn't it? Isn't it lovely? More fun in ratting, I think, than almost anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of fun there for that. It's the great Duke of Beaufort's head. 
The two things I love most in the world are hunting and ratting, and I don't know which I love best. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm certainly. The Lord is a natural. <laughs> it's probably an aquatic rat. Yeah. Oh, have a look at that. Good Lord. Look, that's Harry, a, look. That's Go a on. tail, you know. No. Good heaven. Good Good dog. Good little 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 dog. Wee, Tuggy! How about that? Uh, <laughs> look at that! Lunch! <laughs> eh? Lunch, yes. <laughs> well done, the glatter! <laughs> Go on, Tug! Go on, Tug! Go on, Tug! Go on, Tug! Smooth-coated, Jack Russell-type dog. Oh, is he? Six. Yep. Hooray! One by one. Good luck for the champion. Anyway, that's very good. You look very fetching. Yeah, I really been enjoying it. Well, nice great. man. Yes. Mars over there. Nice man, um said, uh, had I entered him for the next race, he would have won that. Oh, really? Yes. Don't you wish you could go on a fox hunt? It would, it would be just well, great. Well, the thing is, there's, it, there's a whole tribe of people that just go along for the day with the horses. You know, they, they have no part in, you know, the actual hunt hunt, but they're just spectators as such. And it's invariable that they don't catch a fox. Well, I've, I've seen them doing it in Alabama before, and, and they're all in proper English garb. But that was a number of years ago in my childhood that uh, when we would uh, drive up to North Alabama, there was a place off the side of the highway that they had fox hunts. And you'd see everybody in their red and black coats. Oh, and, oh it was just, it was wonderful. Well, going back many years, um, there's a place called Chumley uh, in Cheshire. Chumley Estate, uh, spelt Chumondley, but it's, it's pronounced Chumley. And there was a few police around here, and I was working in the area. It's around Christmas. It was winter time, and I stopped by. I said, "Everything all right?" You know, I've just had first aid kit on board. One thing and another. I've just been, "Oh, it's okay." He says, uh, "We've got the hunt coming through, uh, possibly." And it did. And uh, Prince Charles was amongst them. I didn't know it was he. I was told. But there's quite. But to see the spectacle of an English countryside, and you couldn't see a fox, but you could see the, the hounds going, and you could see the, all the tunics and the people following on behind. It, it was quite emotional, you know, to see that. And in that environment, and, you know, the, and it, you know, the winter... It was lovely. I, 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 I think it, it just seems to be in my mind that's the time of year it was. I might be wrong. Um, but, yeah, again, when I was at primary school, um, our, what the music teacher there, you know, she used to play this uh, this oh, uh, song, you know, to the kids, and we, we all used to sing it, and it was about fox hunting. Um, do you ken John Peel? So there you go. You can jump. Are you about to break into song for us? I, I couldn't remember the words. It was something like, <laughs> can John Peel at the break of the day. Do you can John Peel? With his fox and his hounds in the morning. It, it was 64 years ago. <laughs> but I, may, I may have to put some dancing girls in with you singing. <laughs> Yeah, that'll be the day. Oh, in fact, <laughs> that's a cue for another song, I think. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, I, I know we've uh, we've had a bit of an interview here, and the second part is with Bob Gregory uh, with us most of the time. I hope you're able to tune in for that as well. Uh, did, you will not be disappointed. And Bob has a few stories of, his snuff making days as well. So uh, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful just time of visiting. And it's kind of like you're just joining into an inner 
a little private discussion almost the way that the second part oh, yeah. of the I, interview goes. I think we were spectators at that stage. Um, <laughs> two things, if I may, Professor. One, I hope I haven't upset anybody. I, I have total respect for everybody's point of view. I, it's just that I can see the benefits of, you know, with country sports and conservation. And uh, yes, the, if watching part two, you will be able to witness the uh, editing skills on the bleeper of the professor. <laughs> 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 you have to guess the words, children. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's just one word that's consistently bleeped out. You can oh, maybe there? figure it out. <laughs> is that me? <laughs> All right, brothers and sisters. Well, glad you could join us for yes. this edition of the Fifth Helmet Matinee and be sure to join us next week. Yeah. Take care, everyone. God bless. <laughs>